And welcome, everybody, to another episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. Today, I am super excited. A couple of points. One is this is our 30th episode today. Secondly, this is the first time we're doing it live on video. And third, I've got a good friend, somebody I respect and somebody I've known for a long time, Zach Keeps, on the show today to talk all things real estate, work ethic, entrepreneurship. Zach, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, my friend? Doing amazing, Andrew. Thank you so much for the opportunity of having me on. It's always great to see you and uh, excited. You clean up so well. I love it. Hey, it's special great. occasion to be with my buddy. There we go. So as the listeners know, the Your Wealth and Beyond podcast is built to help each and every one of us build wealth and find purpose. And today we want to talk through with you, Zach, on how you built a real estate, I'm going to call it an empire, but how you came from failure, where you came from the depths of the Great Recession, how you picked yourself up and were able to build this through blood, sweat, and tears. So that work ethic is something that I think a lot of us, we want to have, but it's not for everybody, right? So entrepreneurship, right? You basically are an entrepreneur. You run Zach Ventures. Yeah. Zach Ventures has been in existence now since 2002. So 2002. 17 years. Okay, so you've yeah. been in the, the real estate. How did you get into real estate? What was it? Was that a passion growing up for you in uh, in Michigan? Sure. You know, uh, talking about entrepreneurs, uh, I grew up and blessed that I was socialized in a family of entrepreneurs. My father started his own law business. My grandfathers both had their own individual scrap business, um, and then uh, multiple business on, on my other grandfather's side in terms of development and random businesses, always looking at, uh, you know, different opportunities. One of my grandfathers literally drove around with a checkbook in his uh, pocket, you know, looking at deals ready for execution, you know, with the ammunition to go out there and acquire deals or buy businesses. And this was back in the Detroit area? Back in the Detroit area, Midwest guys. Yeah. So this was in You're a Midwest in guy, right? I am. The, uh, yeah. the great city of Cleveland. We call it Rust Belt Cheek. Okay. And uh, I mean, all you guys are now jumping on the Cleveland Browns bandwagon. But I've been there from the get-go, and right. we, uh, it's funny, my daughter, who's, you know, you know Winter, she's uh, yeah. almost 13, and she's been, for years, she'd make fun of me for the, uh, you know, why, Daddy, how do you watch the Browns, and why are you always crying on Sundays? So now that they're actually uh, got this momentum, she's trying to jump on the bandwagon. Sure. I'm not letting her jump on right now. You know, she's going to have to work for it. But I regress. You know, Cleveland, Detroit. We got the Lions. I, I can feel your sympathy. I mean, it's been a tough, tough run. Tough, tough, tough. But what yeah. we learned in those cities is nothing's given to us. Yeah. We got to work hard in that. So you saw that with your your grandparent and your, and, and, and your dad is just yeah. and still of looking out and working hard, but then understanding the real estate business. Is that how you kind of got your four way into yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, again, growing up and going back to, you know, the Detroit days, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted the ability to work for myself. Unfortunately, I don't like people telling me what to do, you know, so I always knew that uh, I wanted to create my own fortune. and. Um, you know, follow my passion. I had a bagel business growing up. I'd shovel snow. I would sell bracelets. You know, as a kid, you either have it in your blood or you kind of don't. It was always kind of in my blood and always knew that I want to create, you know, some sort of opportunity. Yeah, we say entrepreneurship, there's a there's a trait that for most it's, it's missing from other people and it's whether we're crazy, whether we're not. But we have something where, like you said earlier, you can't work for somebody. You know, you can't be told what to do. So, um, and, and every day you got to look in the mirror and it's, it's on you to make things happen, which is, you know, for some people, they just, they just don't have it in them. Right. So you moved out here to Phoenix, how many years ago? Yeah, it came out literally 2002 in okay. August, super hot. And I uh, came off the airplane. I'm like, what am I doing here? This is uh, ridiculous. But you're young at the time. You didn't really have responsibility and you're just like, let's, let's see if it works. Absolutely. You got to put yourself out there. No risk, no reward. Yeah, I've been out here now almost 20 years. You know, it's easy for us. We could have ended up in Chicago or Los yeah. Angeles or New York. But, you know, this is a city that it's easy living here, right? And you deal with the heat, but um, it's boom bust. And so part of what we'll get into today is on the real estate side, especially with Phoenix, has been through many cycles. We've seen in our time pretty much one major one, right? Absolutely. But um, so you came out in 02 and you're just like, I'm going to just jump right in. And, and that's when you built Zach Ventures as such a young lad. 
it wasn't really, I wouldn't say Zach Ventures was started. Yeah, Zach Ventures was a piece of what I did from 2002, but I started as a joint venture with uh, cousins and my uncle okay. um, out here. Um, so I was blessed to have some capital behind me at the time from 2002 to 2007 till the market basically imploded. Um, as you know, as a Midwest guy, and one of the reasons I was friends with you early on, we met, I think, what, playing basketball or something at the gym? Yep. Yeah, and, and the thing that I love about you, Andrew, and still to this day is you're a hustler. You know, we get up every day and we hustle. Nothing, you weren't given your fortune. I wasn't given right. anything. Uh, and so we wake up every day with that, that mindset of, you know, getting after it. And, and how would you teach, so if somebody comes to you and says, Zach, how, how do you, how do you do that? Is it, what would you say to them? I think it's more or less an innate ability. It's something yeah. that's, you know, intangible. It's instilled in you as an age, or you have to have that fire and know that, hey, this is something, the risk that I want to take. Some people just like know when they want that paycheck and they don't want to think after work nine to five and it works for them. And I respect that. Yeah. And, and just because, you know, that's what they like doesn't mean um, it, in terms of success, um, it is what you make it. I mean, it's, uh, it, success comes not just in capital. It's, you know, are you happy? Are you, do you love what you're doing? You know, yeah, and so when you started working with the family, you were out there just looking at deals, whether it be residential deals, commercial deals, but you just jumped feet first and just tried to learn with the lay of the land here in, in Phoenix and trying to figure out what deals are going to work. Sure, it was mostly uh, single family residential. We were okay. looking at distressed stuff um, early on in the days that was kind of emulating their business model in the Midwest um, out here. So they're looking for uh, diversification with their business, capitalize on another market that was set to boom, and it did from 2002 to 2007 and eight. Our market went from here you know, to here, which was a crazy ride. It was a lot of fun. You could virtually throw a dart at a wall, you're going to hit something and you would make money because the market was appreciating so quickly. Right. And as young as you were to come in and have that success, you probably think that, the, hey, this is how it is. And you kind of, you, you could potentially get a little cocky and make some riskier bets. Is that what happened? You just kept thinking it's going to continue, continue, continue? Yes and no. I mean, obviously when you're on that wave, you think, hey, we're just going to ride this all the way to the beach. Uh, I'm blessed that things happen for a reason. I'm not happy about the market imploding then, but you learn from every lesson. It wasn't that we got oh, you know, ahead of ourselves and saying, all right, we're going to go from $200,000 homes and to go speculate on big commercial buildings, which at the very end, we had some you know, options and, and diversification with larger deals. But like Warren Buffett says, you know, stay within your circumference of understanding of your competence. Um, and I believe that today. It's, it's easy. You make a few dollars and you get cock and you want to start, you know, think you want to make a million dollars overnight. It doesn't happen. You know, my wealth was built one property at a time, low income, and that's my niche. It's easy, again, to get distracted on a day to day basis and think that maybe you throw your money in a stock that you hear as a whisper could be an amazing opportunity. Right. But again, I, I'm, I'm very conservative and I, you know, I don't look to hit home runs. I aim for solid singles and stay with, again within my circle of understanding. And so we'll talk about the success you've had over the last, you know, what, eight, nine years, but let's, let's go into that 07, 08. So, you know, it affected a lot of people, the great recession and, yeah. you know, real estate, it obviously, and out here, it affected a lot of people, whether in the mortgage industry, real estate, developers, et cetera. Did you, did you have a sense that it was, was it a slow train wreck or like, when did you finally realize that things are getting nasty out there and there's, there's some trouble brewing and, and how did that then affect you both professionally and personally? Absolutely. Great question. Um, I mean, it doesn't, it didn't happen overnight per se, but in a certain respect, it somewhat did. I mean, when you're out there and you're on the front lines, when you're in the forest, you don't necessarily see the trees. So it's super important to, no matter who you are, whether, you know, you're Andrew Rafal or Zachary Keeps, to always have a higher visionary or a picture or a colleague, to someone to help give you perspective when you're nestled in that forest, you know, to really see what's going on. Kind of your quarterback, if you're out there playing on the field and you don't have that full vision and scope, and that's why it's important to have somebody like you, Andrew, obviously giving you that different perspective. So me being on the front lines, being deep in that forest, you don't necessarily see it coming on until you start, you know, uh, not getting those phone calls for the deals. And obviously right. the offers are deflected and prices continue. You know, more supply is rising and demand is lower, simple economics. So um, it was a very difficult time to transition from, a, a, you know, a vertical mark going up to a market that's stagnant and then, you know, starts to implode uh, massively. And what do you do in those situations? You want to be as conservative as possible, get out while you can, if possible, um, and take care of your debts. Were you uh, over leveraged at that time? Were you able to get out or I yeah, know a we lot were, of people here we lost were blessed lot. that, you know, we weren't over leveraged at the time. Okay. Um, the, 
the what happened to us was we weren't holding a lot of stuff, which was good. So on a flip business model, if you're just buying and flipping, you're not stuck with a lot of inventory. Right. So after the implosion, we'll get to it, but that's when I started buying when I saw somewhat of a bottom. But during the time, it's very difficult. It's like, you know, you, you're hit with the wave and you're underwater. You're just swimming to get to the top of that, you know, water. It's, it's a difficult time. You're treading as, as much as you can. Right. And then the capital is just drying up. Banks are calling. Oh, absolutely. So I guess the key for you is not being completely over leveraged and not having huge deals that were out there. A lot of maybe smaller deals where some of these developers and landowners, I mean, it's just, you know, it yeah, just we, was the, 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 never in a million years would they have thought that it would have happened the way it did. No, I mean, no one can predict that per se. I mean, there's some economics and theorists out yeah. there that may have, but, you know, again, I always say if you could see that, we'd be at Vegas playing on the tables at, you know, Blackjack. If we could, everyone always asks me, if you can forecast the future, I'll be at the Blackjack or the craps table. I thought we're you getting know? on a plane after the show and we're I going. Would, I would love to. All right, you guys get to. that. So, so you start then starting to see, obviously, trying to make it through, cover your bills. Things aren't good. Yep. And now all of a sudden it's what, 09 and 10? And you start, sure. what, what, what's going on? You're starting to see this huge opportunity. Sure. Let's talk about those two difficult years. Everyone likes to talk about, you know, um, the good times, but let's go back to the bad times. Again, gives you the experience to kind of see and recognize those signals again of, of the market shift and, and the change. Um, you know, by by hunkering down, literally, I rented the, my primary house that I lived in. I rented to a Coyotes hockey player. I living in a, a second home in a bedroom. I was hunkering down just to pay the bills, literally, and just cover my debts. I mean, it was a difficult time. All I knew was real estate, and that's my background, yeah. my blood, my blood and sweat and tears, as you talked about. So it was a scary couple of years. There wasn't a lot of transactions. There was some short sales. You can pick up some ancillary income through, you know, representation. In fact, I represented you on a great deal we picked up uh, as a primary, I believe, back in that heyday yeah, you know, that coming was back out of that. maybe one of your one of your first deals yeah that was, on, on the retail side but you know before we get into the deals like when you're going through this dark time yeah right and this a lot it's not like you were the only one sure but like you know when you're waking up in the morning or you're trying to go to bed at night yeah what were you doing to say sane in knowing that your bank accounts dwindling you got all these deals outstanding yeah. you got things not moving what kept you going day in and day out um great question i mean you just got to be always optimistic i think health and mental health and for me, it's physical fitness. Everyone's got their outlet of stress relief. If I would have done nothing and just laid in bed and, and fallen into depression, you know, that could have been the worst possible thing. Instead, I got motivated through sport, through triathlon and fitness. And to me, that's what gets that release and that kind of ang potential anxiety through um, the hardships that we were experiencing to get me kind of going, uh, get out of that that funk, if you will, because it was a very, very difficult time. But I remained optimistic. I stayed in good health and physical fitness, uh, clean, you know, cleansed my mind so I could think, you know, um, positively and uh, focused and kind of was waiting for that opportunity to come back into the market to capitalize on the skills that I've acquired and, and honed in for the last, you know, seven or eight years. Yeah, so listeners, that's great advice. And it doesn't have to be a, a ter time where it's in turmoil. It's also a time where you're, you know, running a business. You got to keep your mind and, and, and your body healthy and you got to yeah. eat right. And you got to find what, what your passion is and, and focus on that. It's not always about work. But I assume you also kept your network out there too, right? Yeah. In your industry, even though everyone's kind of feeling it, keep your network out there, not hide into a, your room, right? And just n knock it out there. So that that's important. Did you ever think like, yeah, because I know your, your brother-in-law runs a DJ company back then. Where, did you ever think you'd have to go work for him? Was that ever in the mind? You know, DJ is not my skill set, but you know, at the time you do what you got to do. I mean, yeah. I was always looking at other opportunities short term, but if I needed to spin some records for my brother-in-law, I certainly, you know, wouldn't be opposed to that. I you got to do what you got to do at the end of the day. There's no harm. Again, I remember going on dates with women. Where are you living? I'm living in a second bedroom in my parents' house. No shame in that game. It is what it is. You got to hunker down and do what you got to do to survive. Right. And with your charming personality, I'm sure they got through that and they know, hey, this guy's going to make it at some times. And the one that didn't, then, you know, look, they'll look back and say, hey, sh I should have stayed with the guy. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. Okay. So we got through these somewhat dark times and then you realize there's a tremendous opportunity single family homes. So yep. let's let, let the listener know like how how bad did things get here from the 05, 06, 07 into then what you were buying through yourself, through investors, eight, 10 and 11. What, yeah. what, what was that threshold there? 
Sure. Uh, great question. So, um, you know, from 2002 to 2007, we were acquiring homes at 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars. We were selling them for 100. As the market continued to appreciate, um, it became somewhat of an irrational, exuberant market. We started to get every one in four homes, if you knew that statistic in Arizona, was bought by some sort of investment company. Okay. So there was a lot of demand. Prices went from 100 thousand, basically in the lower income, and hit a kind of a top threshold of 200, 210. Those homes at the 210, we were buying those at the very, very end of the market for 150, 160, putting in 20, you know, and selling them for 200, maybe make 10 grand, five, 6% back in the day. On a flip, it was decent if you can move them, uh, that inventory quickly and, and roll it through the cycle. So then fast forward to that times of 2008, 2009, when we kind of hit that bottom, um, Warren Buffett says, when people are greedy, be fearful. Right. When people are fearful, be greedy. We became greedy because those same homes that we were trading at 200 retail and 210, Andrew, now we're trading at 30 and $40,000. I mean, the talk about depreciation and getting annihilated. So listeners, this one's that 210, and these aren't, these aren't huge homes. These are like 2,000 square foot homes. Smaller than that, 1,500, 1,400 okay. square feet block construction homes, less than the cost of, you know, building these properties. And part of the issue was on those homes that with the, the, the the no money down and these undocumented loans. People were just buying three, four houses at a time with no real income. If you had a heartbeat, you could qualify literally for multiple homes. You knew if you go to get your haircut and your hairstylist says, I own seven homes in the subdivision, it may be a signal, ding, ding, ding. If everyone's buying, you right. know, start running. That's the same thing as like we had Bitcoin last year. We call it the taxi drive, the taxi cab driver. You know, when they start telling you they bought four homes or right. they, you know, tech boom bust. So you can almost see that happen. It's yep. just trying to time it. Right. So you saw this opportunity, but now capital for you isn't there because you've lost all this money from these deals. So what we talk about our deal, like when you got back into it and realized that, hey, I, I need partners. Sure. What was that like? How did you think through on what, what's going to make sense where you're going to do the work and then bring in these partners? Uh, walk the listener through how you kind of pull Absolutely. yourself up. Absolutely. So it. we saw uh, another one of my favorite quotes. Um, Peter Lynch says, you know, you don't have to buy um, at the bottom or sell at the top as long as you get a big chunk in the middle. Um, I'm not a greedy person. I'm always looking to get a decent chunk in the middle and again, not hit a home run and not trying to swing for the fences. Um, I had a great history of success um, before. I've never burned anybody. I've never defaulted faulted on anything. And so it was all about what's called OPM, other people's money. So I devised a business model where it's 50-50. I had all the realtor and agent and wholesale relationships to acquire deals, um, still maintain those relationships that you talk about. Even in the downturn, you still want to get up, you wake up in the morning, you maybe do your exercise, you call your colleagues, you call the title companies. What's happening in the marketplace? Who's doing deals? What's, you know, what are the cap rates? What are the returns? So as long as you keep your pulse on the market and you're kind of watching and, and staying immersed in that environment, then you're ready to execute. Well, I was ready to execute when, again, we saw these homes trading so low with rents that really hadn't changed from the 200,000 okay. price point down to the 30. So if rents were $1,000 at 200,000, but that same home you can buy at $30,000 and get $1,000 in rent, you're getting an astronomical return. You know, 20 plus right. cap rate, which is a and 20%. It's a, it's never going to happen return. again in our lifetime, probably. And I, I, I hope not. If it is, that's a buy sign, folks. Go out and buy as You're many right. as you can. So that being said, I was stuck. Like you say, banks were nervous. They didn't want a loan on single family because they just got wiped out like most people. And so it was all about where can you get available cash? If there's no loans, you could get potentially hard money. That was super expensive. People are charging 18, 20%. And there wasn't tons of money in that market yet. It wasn't as widely available as it is now. So it was all came down to what affluent high net worth individuals were in my sphere. Um, of uh, you know individuals that I knew to call them and say, hey, look, here's the business model that I've created. I'm put together a fund, and uh, I'll run the whole thing. Take no management fees, no commissions, no nothing. So I have a full vested interest in the deal. And every deal we will acquire, the investor puts up the capital, do the work. On the disposition side, we sell that property, and then we split the profits 50-50. And that was either if you flipped it or the rental, you kept it and, and the rental income, you would just basically create a, a, a little LLC return. and a yep. return for them. So that that's an interesting component there. So you had to deal with a lot of mini investors, even though they're high net worth, but they trusted you and you know we weren't talking huge capital. So people just let you do your thing. Yep. And that's when you started then building this network of, you obviously had, had a good accountant or CPA to deal with all of those LLCs, all of those deals. Yep. But then with doing all the work, you know what I think separates you from others out there is that you're able to connect and get the right contract 
contractors and be able to communicate with them and get down on on uh, you know get your hands dirty right yep. so that was uh did you did you start building relationships with like one contractor or was it a combination where you had a lot of different teams out there that were helping you redevelop or remodel or rehab or whatever sure. it may be to get that house up and running yeah i mean it's all about um connections and it's all about relationships just like in anything it's you know you never want to burn any relationships even in the downturns easy to forget about those people that work with you before you know constructing the homes and those guys were kind of sitting on the sidelines trying to make do too so they were super excited because i maintained and rekindled those relationships that i had prior to the bust and those guys all of a sudden have cousins and brothers and they see the opportunity so we were running six seven crews at a time wow after that market i mean we were trying again to buy everything that we possibly could i had deals in escrow that were pre-sold and, and hedge funds started to come in so you fast forward a couple years and it was just a wild fun time again this is now what we're talking about we're at the right place at the right time and i believe in serendipity and things like that and good good karma right if you don't screw people you're transparent in your business model you pay your contractors on time you take care of your investors you run good clean accounting and you have a recipe for success and uh you know i'm not the smartest guy in any room and you know my act score is nothing uh they, it's, it's laughable so you're telling me you didn't have a uh, somebody take that test for you your parents didn't pay for you to get into where'd you go to indiana i went to the kelly school business fine institution indiana university okay, so the your ACT the must, Midwest. i thought that's what they call miami of ohio mm. where i went we might have to uh Excuse in me. the show notes we'll actually get to the uh, bottom of that but i do believe it's miami of ohio but that's another uh, that's another podcast um, so you, you, your ACTs must have been okay. So when we think about then why in your industry, you've been through a lot, you've seen a lot of brokers, you've seen developers, why do you think a lot of them, the ones that do fail, what do you think that they do wrong or they could do better? Sure. I mean, I think it's all about relationships. I think people a lot of times are short minded and short sighted in terms of, you know, money. They, they, they only think about the capital at hand. And if they have to screw somebody, I like to call it a zero sum game. If one person wins and another person loses, no one wants to do business with you again. If you're there to, you know, yeah. uh, draw blood every single time, no one, uh, again, Same zero sum it doesn't work. Well. You know, Correct. If you take good care of your people, be transparent. Yep and you know be open and honest if the deal's not going to work you, you can't hide from it no nope, no nope. and so um, we're here for the long term we're young guys um aggressive but always fair um i always look for a win-win-win if, if there's someone in the transaction is going to lose i will walk away from the deal it's just how it has to be and that's why i'm still here there's still a lot of guys in the business that have got out of the business because they only cared about how quick they can make that fast buck yeah. it, just like real estate it's a marathon it's not a sprint so again i'm not looking to get rich and i wasn't planning to get rich overnight it's a long game it's you know like an iron man you you have to put in the time the energy do all the work together you don't just wake up and become an iron man the next day you have to go through the training you have to go through the nutrition you have to put in the time the energy the blood sweat and tears to get to that finish line it's not easy and it's not for everybody but if you can you know execute and, and stay the path then you'll be in good shape and so, you know, 07, 08, kind of the depths, and then one house at a time, one house at a time. And then ultimately, so you said private equity started kind of sniffing around Phoenix. They had yeah. started capital, started becoming more available, the Fed lowering the rates to basically nothing or negative. Yeah. So what happened then? You started, so how many homes did you have or have you at the high point? Can we talk about that or is that a secret? No, there's no secrets here. This is just okay. an open and honest environment. Um, so I would say, you know, we were flipping up into the markets in 2007. We were doing around 200 deals a year. Me, my uncle, my cousins, and that was a wild time until, of course, the market imploded. Right. And of course, again, we were not over leveraged, so we really didn't get hurt. I got hurt because I went to diversified investments thinking, okay, I'll get some um, passive income outside of Arizona because I was worried about our market and that's what came back to bite me. That's how my net worth was good and then it just got annihilated because again, I didn't have full documentation on some investments and uh, it just didn't pan out for me and that's a good lesson learned. No matter where you invest or whatever you do, make sure that statue of frauds, whatever you're doing is in writing, you're protected um, and you're just fully backed on whatever your investment is. It, what's it collateralized by? Is there a personal guarantee? How's the company's liquidity? What if you need a capital call? Those are all good questions you need to ask in any investment, real estate, alternative investments, or whatever it is. I'm sure when you're looking at your clients, you say, what is the downside risk of this deal? What's the upside potential? This is what we're looking at, but also can we lose here? And if we can, can we mitigate risk? You know, I'm sure yeah. that's an important factor for you and your clients. Yeah, so it was, I guess, the, the your deals that you were actually in control of didn't really bring you under. It was these outside deals. Correct. And so, you know, that hits home to what we talk about with our business owner clients and executives that work for a company is, 
you know, you don't want to have all your eggs in that basket. So like real estate, you know, you had all your eggs in that basket, not real. You were diversified in different deals, but ultimately it all came back down to real estate. So when things hit the fan, then boom, 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 all gone. So that's one thing we preach, whether you're in, you know, you know, real estate, you know, you can turn that dollar into 10 times a lot easier yep. than you going out and doing something else. But you've also realized from that, I assume that you've got to have your eggs in different baskets and different investments and not just in real estate. Absolutely. And that's where a lot of people fall off. You know, we see in these uh, executives that have all their money tied up in their stock. Obviously, we know what happened in 99, 2000, 2001. But, you know, it's easy to kind of drink that Kool-Aid and be like, hey, I know that we're, 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 we're moving ahead and I'm helping the company grow. But then ultimately, one bad or two bad earnings reports or if they're a private company, everything blows up. So the key is have a have a game plan so that you don't make stupid decisions or decisions on based on emotions yep. or let the markets dictate it. And then all of a sudden you have your hands are tied. You're getting a margin call or the banks are calling. So private equity then, they, they got involved in uh, just more so they, they were looking and saying, you guys have done the hard work. We need yield. We need, yep. we need to put some money to work. Yep, absolutely. So it was interesting. I mean, these guys all of a sudden came in literally overnight and you start getting a knocks. Any, any uh, single family homeowner that had, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 homes at the time, these guys were targeting through tax records and public records said, knock, knock, knock. Can I help you? Yeah, hi, we have a billion dollars we're looking to deploy. Very funny. I thought it was a joke. I'm so they actually came calls. to your door? I mean, they don't literally knock on the door, but they were calling my yeah, phone. Yeah, basically the same. I was like, can I help you? This must be a joke. You know, click, call again. No, we're for real. Great, send me a proof of funds. And it's like, they're literally sending you, you know, 300 million in account A. Guess these guys are for real. And so you got to take, you know, go through the motions. I met with uh, they had all these different acquisition guys and uh, met with them. I said, okay, if you can pay me X and this is what you guys are comfortable paying, which was the top of the market, I'm a seller. Again, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold sure. them. But if you can buy the base, again, we spoke about it before, Peter Lynch, and they, now they're get offering at the top at the time, you're a seller. If you can make, yeah. you know, 200% on your money in three or four months, take some money off the table. Again, great lesson. Don't be greedy. You hit a home run, move on. Or what's called dollar cost average into the market. If you can sell here, but you know you still have relationships where you can buy over here, Andrew, then it's a great spread. And if you can continue to do that, it's a domino effect of, you know, great returns. Yeah, I mean, that, and it is, sometimes it's easier said than done to do that because, right. they, you know, pigs do get slaughtered. But, Correct. you know, when you think about the market and how it's moving, people get greedy. So for you to look at that and say, you know what, I'm cool with taking some profits off the table. You can never be mad. You can never look at the mirror and say, hey, I took, I made some money and I took it off the table. Yep. Looking back, yeah, maybe you would have held those. You could have had more appreciation, but it would just, you know, also more headache, you know. So unloading that and taking some risk off and allowing you then to deploy capital and other deals think it's a smart deal, especially how many times are you going to have a hedge fund be able to come in and say, hey, I want to buy 50 houses at right. a time? Correct. I mean, they would do deals 10, 10 houses at a time. You take 40, 50. I mean, at a certain point, yeah, I did a 40 home package to a hedge fund, multiple 20s. I mean, it's wild. And the thing is, was great about it, there's no emotion. If you're going to sell to a typical homeowner, you're going through all these inspections. They, of course, did inspections, which is fine. Okay. But there's no emotion. When you're dealing with just straight Wall Street capital, it's not like, hey, I need you to fix this. If you're not going to put the towel bar, you're not going to you know, fix this shingle. Great. We just want a $3,000 concession on the price, and we're going to move forward and close. It takes away the emotion. It's cleaner. It's easier. You may have left a few bucks on the table, but if you take away that emotional, you know, mental um, aspect of it and you can move that inventory quicker and redeploy that because you know that you're going to have four or five million dollars from one quick sale to then go out and acquire new assets. Boom, move on. You know, yeah. again, maybe pick up a few thousand dollars or a few points more on a retail deal, but how much time and energy do you expend dealing with that individual agent, dealing with the emotional aspect of that buyer, the negotiation process? So sometimes in this situation, it's much easier um, when you look at the, the macro picture to sell to one entity and then continue to grow and redeploy that money in this market. So, you know, I will get into some of your social media that you're doing now, but for many years you were not promoting, not marketing. So how did you get the, the Zach Keeps name out there, the Zach Ventures, all those that, those years and having people bring you deals? Like what, what can we, you know, recommend to those that are listening? How can we help them make, you know, that type of network happen? Sure. Um, it starts and that's, it's all about reputation and execution. I mean, I got to say it really boils down to transparency, ethics, execution, you know, communication, relationships. I mean, that's what I built from the ground floor, when, just like our friendship, you know. 
Um, if someone brings me a deal and, and is a Midwest guy, I like to say that, again, I see it out here. People are somewhat lazy in business out in out in yeah. the West. Um, we come from that Midwest hustle. So you come out here and hustle. You're the first guy to that house and you call up that agent. I want the deal and I'm sending in the offer and you execute. People love that. Um, so if you treat people well, you have fun with what you're doing. And again, you get it done. You don't do what's called retrading. People want to do more deals with you. They know that you're going to close the deal. There's going to be no headaches. And so... Who doesn't want to deal with deal? Who doesn't want to deal with people that are executing in that capacity, are fun to work with, um, and are persons of their word and yeah. integrity? Yeah, and they're getting things done. You know, it's amazing uh, all the success that you've had and you continue to have. If somebody were to look at you and not know that and just watch you or follow you for a day or a, two days or a week, you, they'd probably think this guy's just trying to make it right. So it's it's one of those. It's a motivating factor. You know, financially, you're independent. But it's like that drive is just, you just have, you, you must be having fun still getting out there and doing it, I closing the it. deals, finding the deals, helping people. But you're also putting people to work too, yep. which is cool. I mean, think about how many people over the last 10 years that you've put to work in, I mean, what do you think? Hundreds of people, right? Through all the labor and the construction and, and the, the, the different financing and so forth. So that's, you know, it's kind of like you're running your own business. But having you don't have any employees at this point? They're all 1099. I'm mean, have an assistant, bookkeeper, yeah. and things like that. But again, they're all like family. You treat them well. They're all independents. Um, it's like a big game of Monopoly, but it's real money. I wake up every day. I'm blessed. But I go with the mentality. I like to say I wake up broke in my mind every single day. So you wake up and hustle. It's kind of a unique mentality to keep. You wake up, set the tone for the day to work out. If you look at your bank account and you take one with a zero and you say today, if I don't work, I'm not going to eat, you're, you're hungry. you got to make good business decisions. You know, yeah, no, have I have some no fun. Doubt. So, you know, what I've, I've noticed for you over the last maybe couple of months is that you've You've looked at now trying to get the brand out there, the Zach Ventures and using social media, whether it's be Instagram or Facebook, you know, back a couple of years ago, I don't think you'd even do a podcast. So sure. what changed on there and, you know, you having fun doing it, but like what, what's going on? What are we trying to accomplish with getting you out there and doing those videos and having fun and showing your personality and your work ethic? Sure. Um, you have to adapt to the market. I mean, social media has always been around, but it's always progressively getting more and more adaptable. And you have all these young hustlers that we started when we were, you know, early 20s. These guys are out there with the Instagram and the podcasts and, you know, these big shows. And, you know, I was always deflected from that. I always like to stay under the radar and I like to be humble. And you can still be humble with your social media and whatnot. And you don't have to show your material possessions because no one really cares about that. If anything, people kind of get deterred from it. But again, that's just my opinion. I think, uh, like you said, I roll around in my Prius, stay humble. You know, I'm not a showboat kind of guy. It's not my thing. Um, but again, I see the success that these young guys have, and this is kind of the wave of the future. You have to put yourself out there and continue to grow your networks. As we progress in our careers and our you know um, business models, some of these older people are getting out, and it's these new young guys that are in there. And if we are slow to adapt to this new social media platform, we may be pushed aside too as these guys are getting deals and doing their unique advertising. I'm not advertising direct to homeowners. You say, what's the benefit? The benefit is to connect with more wholesalers, these young guys, which are leveraging the social media to get more deal volume, which is good. Also, look, you, when you're out there and you have good branding, good presence, you get referrals from people, yep. people that may, hey, may get a massive deal and I may need to raise a, a mass amount of capital. If I'm staying in touch with people and there's a unique opportunity to you know, put together some sort of alternative fund for a major distress uh, portfolio or commercial or apartment building, guess what? Those relationships are there. So you never want to burn any bridges. I continue to grow, adopt, and uh, just think about the future. And you're able to put your real personality out there. I know, you know, social media, it's not for everybody, but sure. you're able to do a quick little snippets, get people get it. I think I just saw one recently where you did this, uh, you call it what, trash to cash? Trash to cash, And yeah. so you went, you were inside somebody's house you had a like a, a, a suit on like sure. a ghost. What was that? That was a, like it was a hoarder's house. Literally, I mean, we buy the more distressed it is, the better. So we like to create value from the ground floor. So a lot of times, you know, if it's disgusting and there's hoarders or cats or you know dead bodies, we've seen it all. Um, so if we can come in there and clean it up and literally create. Um, value through rehab, through good economies right. of scale. That's how you create value. So trash, literally, that we're buying, turning it to cash to create some sort of annuity of cash flow through rentals. We're flipping it. That's kind of the real business model. And a lot of times, you know, I'm always a jokester, as class, a class clown uh, in, in high school yeah. and whatnot. You got to have fun with what you're doing. And so I was making these mockery videos just as a joke on Facebook, but people loved it. I mean, yeah. for whatever reason, they're attracted to because I'm real, I'm raw. And I'm like, wait a second, if I do a little more of this, it could just be, again, beneficial, but in the right taste and the right capacity. And uh, I've gotten agents who have called me, said, 
I didn't realize that's what you did. You know, if you get one extra call or one extra deal, what does it cost to put a 10 second video, uh, you know, out in social media? Zero, I spend zero dollars on social media and I pride myself on that. So if you can self-generate deals and revenues from, you know, authentic media and social media, what a blessing. Yeah, that's, you know, that what you just said earlier is that they didn't know that you did that, you know, and that's something in any line of business. You yep. gotta make sure your clients or your people or your network knows what you do and who you wanna work with. Even in our industry, you know, let your clients know that you're looking for like-minded, not, hey, give me give me three names, you know, but it's, we take good care of you. Is there anybody that's out there? We're, we're looking to take on clients like you, making sure people are aware of that and social media allows us to do that. Where we're not selling, it's more of let's push out good information, yep. let's do things like the podcast or, you know, different blogs and books and then let people learn about us and learn about you and then they can come to you. So you're actually starting to see some results already from the- I love it, you know, it's a great point. I mean, when you talk about it natural, I don't push anything on anybody. It's like, I like to use the word organic. Things just evolve naturally, organically. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. You know, you're, you're gonna connect with certain people naturally. If they see that, you know, again, you're buying distressed assets and they thought you're just a realtor or something, they're not going to call you. But if there's an opportunity, they say, hey, I've had a lot of agents say, hey, I didn't realize you could pay cash. You can close quickly. My clients are getting divorced. You know, let, would you be interested in this deal? And again, a simple phone call, you know, we'll let you know right away. Now, you weren't, when you went into that hoarder's house, you weren't actually going through that crap in those piles or were you? I mean, a lot of it was social media based, but you know, I would help my guys for. I mean, I have the suit. Yeah. I would, so you're helping a little bit. Shipped it in on Amazon, but again, I'm not out there doing the work. Yeah. I credit my guys for that. Um, but I have no shame. If somebody needs a hand, we'll, we'll clean it out. You know, put on the gloves. We'll get into the thick of things. I have no problem going knee deep into the, you know, junk into and, the trash. And I thought what was cool in that video is that you were the, the who I think somebody passed away, but then the, with the family, you're like, we're gonna whatever we find in here that's valuable, we're going to set it aside and we're going to give it to you. So that's, that's And we did actually, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, if I'm buying from a wholesale and the wholesaler has a relationship with the seller, because a lot of times I won't interface nowadays with the previous owners. So they bring me in, they what's called assign me the contract in a wholesale relationship, which we can talk about later. But I won't have that interaction, so I don't have the relationship with the seller, but I will have that with the wholesaler. But I'll give you my word, if we come across something or value for the family, which we did, we found $5,000 of savings bonds that the owner had in a corner and some bucket or something that we sent out to the family. I mean, it was an unbelievable story. That's great, yeah. and that's the type of stuff that sets you apart. Right. How many people would have maybe just pocketed that and so forth. So sure. those are the type of things you gotta keep doing. So when you think about you know advice that was given to you, whether it's family, friends, contemporaries, I mean, what is some of the, do you, is there any best advice that has helped you excel in what you do doing professionally and personally? I mean, stick to what you know. It's easy to kind of, you know, get distracted in life and you hear about your buddy making money selling diamonds or, you know, your buddy is doing stocks or stay the course. If you're good at what you do and you're passionate about it, you know, there's going to be trials and tribulations and hardships. But if that's your passion and you're good at it, stick with it. I was great at real estate. A very close friend of mine, Isaac uh, Scheibel, I think you know him. Yeah. Um, you know, again, in that in that difficult time, 2008, and I'm like, I don't know, you know, it's easy to like run or wait for the market to turn. It could have been four or five years. He's like, dude, you're great at what you do. I'll even invest, you know, I'll invest with you, um, but stick with it. You're amazing at it. So there's a lot of times it's easy to get discouraged. Again, I like to use the analogy of a marathon or an endurance event. There's going to be times during that four hours or five hour run or a 11 hour race that you feel terrible and you just want to pull over and take a nap or just throw in the towel keep moving forward. I mean, it's like a lot of times your mind plays games on you saying, oh, pull over and go, but your body has the ability to keep moving forward and executing. Stay the course. Also, treat people the same way you wanna be treated. Don't screw anybody. I mean, it's a small world. You do one, can I swear on here? You can do anything you want. You do one shitty deal and you burn one person, you know, um, it's gonna come back to you. So I believe in that karma. So if you have a very good reputation, you execute, you treat people well, the same way, like again, when I went out and I lost my money through poor investments and I went out there to raise OPM, the other people money, and I'm sitting on this side of the table saying, hey, I've been in your seat, you invest with me before, I'm gonna protect you. And here's the protocols we're gonna put in place to make sure you're protected. That's super important. So you can relate and connect with those people and know that they're gonna be secure in that investment. Now you're not, you're saying OPM, not saying OPP? Down with OPP? Uh, so you're not saying, okay, no, so OPM. Money. Got it. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, when you, you're passionate, you, you've done some Ironmans in the past. Yeah. Doing any coming up? 
Uh, no, I mean, once an Ironman, always an Ironman. But, you know, maybe in the future. It's a very selfish sport. It takes up a lot of time. I'm just a deal junkie now, just trying, you know, continue to grow and buy. You talk about mission. I want to continue to grow um, my rental portfolio, do more flips, make sure my guys stay busy, and continue to have fun, you know? Yeah, you got, do, you got to have the time like. with You've got your dog. You can't, I mean, you have to have the time for the dog. You can't Absolutely. be doing it. I mean, Iron Man, it's just incredible to think you, that you are able to do it and train for it. I just don't get it. Anybody can do it again. It's not like it's some. It seems crazy and outrageous, but nowadays it's uh, it's very achievable. But again, it's not like you just wake up and do it. You have to have a plan, just like in business, a system, a coach. That's why people, even myself, need guys like you um, to quarterback. Like I followed yeah. a protocol. I didn't just create my own training and say, I'm going to become an Iron Man. I looked at the professionals and said, what are these guys doing? How many hours do I need to swim, bike, and run? What do I need to eat? You know, even today I'm heavily invested in real estate and I have some equities, but I call you and say, Andrew, what am I missing? What, what, here's my yields I'm getting today. You're, you're a investment advisor. What, what, what piece of the puzzle am I missing? So it's important to have a quarterback like you to make sure again, that you're looking over my forest when I'm nestled in that trees to make sure I can navigate my way out. Yeah, and that in our industry, it's changed so much over the last decade. It's not it's not just about the investments. It's you know, when you work with a planning firm, it's helping, like you said, look at the forest or coordinating, acting as that quarterback, making sure the tax planner is working, the estate planner, and looking at ways to help minimize taxes. A lot of our clients, Absolutely. business owners, entrepreneurs in the real estate side, you know, we're again heavy in real estate, but they're getting crushed on taxes. So. Yeah. Things setting up, whether it's a solo 401ks or defined pension plans, how you can put more money in your pocket, much more than, hey, did we beat the market? You know, overall, we know what the market, the markets are going to do what they do, and we know we're, we're not going to hit the home run. We don't want to strike out, but, you know, last quarter, tough. But when we have a game plan and you have those pieces together working in, in unison, that's where you set that value. So you listeners out there, you know, when, when you're working with your team, just make sure you got a trusted team, whoever that is, and not somebody who's trying to sell you something or one guy over here, a gal over here, nobody's talking. If nobody's talking, how that's going to help you, especially if you're running and gunning and you're a business owner, you're an executive, you barely have time for yourself, let alone your family, let alone getting your, your retirement plan in place. So it's on all of those aspects. In the real estate field, it's make sure that you, you connect yourself and, and put yourself with good people, right? I'm sure you've had people over the years, you're just like, I'm not working with that person ever again. Absolutely. Whether yeah. they, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, they do you wrong or they, you, you, they're they dead. Absolutely. They're I dead had a wholesaler you. guy call me yesterday. He's like, hey, I just got a call from this guy. He's looking to buy and hold. I said, oh, it's small world. How many is looking to buy? He's like 20 to 30. You know, guy says his name, start running. You know, yeah. it's a small world. You're just not going to do business with people that, uh, you don't have poor reputation. Um, so it's now, super important. Another thing for you, traveling, I know is big for you, right? You try to get out there and, and, and I've traveled the a lot before. Um, I love it. I think a lot of people are ethnocentric and you know, they really just about, um, you know, the US. I think you learn a lot by, you know, individual autonomous type travel because um, it forces you to engage with other cultures, societies, foods. Um, I speak Spanish, which is, you know, very favorable in this market yeah. in Arizona because I have a lot of clients that, you know, and renters that are Hispanic. A lot of the con contractors are uh, Latino. Um, so it comes in handy. And there's that mutual respect. If you can communicate with them their language, people love that. It's, it's a true connection factor. And for you being a mentor out there, a young guy, gal, you know, getting into the business, is that something that's a passion for you to be able to get out there and help somebody else become successful and teaching them the ropes? Sure. I've had a lot of calls. I've had uh, an internship or two where guys have, you know, um, emulated my business model, came out, taught them some fundamentals. I'm slammed, but I'm always happy to pick up a phone. Anyone calls, they have advice on a deal or is it a good buy or a bad buy? I'm always accessible and available to help anybody that wants to underwrite. I mean, I know the Arizona market, so I've had calls. Hey, what do you think of this deal in California or New York? No clue. You want to find a local expert. Sure. It'd be like my buddy telling me, hey, go buy the stock. I appreciate the advice. Let me call Andrew. Let me get a professional to evaluate yeah. that and make sure that it's a good, you know, opportunity. It's it's funny how people can make irrational decisions. I heard that this is a great company. What are the fundamentals? You know, it's there's a lot of misinformation out there. Again, so it's always good to ask uh, an expert in that domain. So you want to talk about single family? distressed real estate in Arizona, give me a call. You wanna talk about equities and a quarterback for your whole financial and tax planning? Call Andrew. You know, that's why it's super important to know who are those experts in those domains and those niches. Yeah, I mean, you think about just even last year, year, 18 months ago or so, Bitcoin, right? 
Bitcoin was one of those those boom busts where everybody was seeing all these people making money and then they just, hey, I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna be able to turn my 10,000 into 200,000 right. and everyone just got crushed. So right. usually when you hear that type of galloping into it, the, the top is in right. and it's time to run. Absolutely. So then we don't know what the next one will be. Um, I know a lot of the listeners out there, you know, when we think, I know you can't predict the market, but what are we feeling right now with regards to not just the Phoenix market, but what are you feeling in regards to the real estate market, both Phoenix, East Coast, West Coast? Where are we right now in the cycle? Sure. From a macro perspective, I mean, look, we've seen a lot of appreciation from where we saw at the bottom. So looking at a you know, snapshot of where we were from 2009, fast forward a decade later, I mean, we've seen massive, massive recovery. I think we're going to see, I'm cautiously optimistic about the market. Again, if I could predict it, we're going on a plane to Vegas in five minutes and go put it all on black. Um, but that's not the case. I always look at what's the downside risk. Forget about Bitcoin. I don't want to take, you know, these crazy risks. I don't need to try and make $2 million in, you know, 50 cent investment too much risk for me because the zero sum game on that, I'm losing my 50 cents and that 50 cents was important. I care about if the market does turn, whenever I'm buying in today's market, what will happen if the if the market value decreases? Where do I see the rents going? And rents are super strong because if less people are buying, there's to be more renters. So there's somewhat of an inverse relationship. So if there's a correction in the market, I meaning pricing coming down, okay. there's going to be an increase in the uh, rental value because more people are going to be on the street looking for rental opportunity. So as long as you could stay the course or you have calculated leverage, meaning you have borrowing money from a bank at a at a reasonable rate and you can outperform that, then you have stability. A lot of people got in trouble before because they had hard money. At 18 percent, the market drops, there's a capital call on it, and all of a sudden you're done. Or the, the money's coming in and you were buying that asset just because you thought it's going to continue to appreciate. I don't buy based on appreciation. I buy based on what's my cash on cash return in today's market. And even if it went down and my capital invested, what will be my yield? Because if you look at someone who held in 2007 to today, they would have been fine if they would have stayed the right. course. I think that's kind of a theme in that anything, we're driving today. It, Stay the course. Yeah, because the motions get in the way. And that's right. why if you have a trusted partner working with you, they can help you not make those rash decisions. Yep. You know, one thing we read about these millennials, right? And like, hey, they're never going to own homes. I'd love to get your, your feedback on that because I just don't think that's, I, I personally don't think that's the case. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to have families. They're not going to want to live in, in an apartment. They're not going to. But what do you think? I mean, the millennials, we as the Gen Xers are kind of sandwiched in between there. There's over 80 million of them. Yeah. You think they're going to drive this market on the, the residential side over the next 10, 15 years? I mean, I sure I certainly hope so. I think that, um, you know, our economy is still pretty stable right now. I think that at a certain point, they're going to realize that they're not really building anything for their future. I have this conversation with a lot of those types of people that rent from them. Like, look, I love you and I'm happy to, you know, continue to take your monthly rental income, but you've got a great job. I'm looking at your application. What is your goal? I mean, I interface with these people daily and I say, you know, hey, uh, Paul and Julie, w w what's your game plan? You want to just rent forever? I mean, you're paying 1500 for rent. If you were to buy this exact home, for example, your pay would be $1,200, yeah. $1,300. Well, we're not sure. So there's kind of that uh, ambiguous, you know, delay. But I, I'm a believer that through proper coaching and understanding of, of wealth building, that they will buy. You know, I think they just need to have a little more education out there. Um, but I'm not sure what the fire is for these people. Um, like you said, I don't know if they're just passive or maybe it's the environment that they grew up in or they're fearful because they're just coming out of our market where they saw the markets tumble and there's that fear factor, right? So it's not for everybody, um, yeah. but, I'm, but I'm hopeful and I try and coach these people and tell them, look, again, happy to take your monthly income, but I'd love for you to buy the house, B build something for your family, you know, yeah. legacy. I mean, and rates are so low right now. And just this, this last pullback we saw on the 10 year treasury rates are, you know, down to four and four and a quarter, even at five, that's still right. historically low. Correct. So we want to lock that in. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, it comes down to that decision of maybe they just want to be free and clear and not have to worry and be able to go to the next thing. But I think overall, life happens and you want to lay some roots, yep. you want to have a family. But I guess that, that'll be to, to be seen. Same thing on like the, the retiree market. We're seeing more and more people that are selling their house, downsizing, and then they're just like, you know what? I don't need to own. Yep. I'm going to have a turnkey. I'm going to have that. I can go to the airport. I can go here. I can go here. So when we have clients come to us and say, hey, what should I do? We want to walk through and look at the emotions and just know this isn't so much needs to be an investment for you anymore. Right. Or if you've got 800000 in your house, should we unlock that and downsize? Do you really need the 4,000 square foot house that has you know, two, you know, the, the two floors? Right. So there's a lot of what that's going to do is, is change the markets. But you know, overall, Arizona, 
they're moving out here left and right every single month. So they're they're building, building, building. And eventually, uh, they'll get to a point where they're like, you know, it boom bust. Absolutely. I mean, talking about you know these retirees, it's funny. I have a unique strategy that I'm happy to share. So we have a place called Sun City. It's a 55 plus community, big area out west in the north, you know, West Valley. Yep. And there's a lot of homes that are just older. They're built in the 80s or 70s or you know 60s, and they need massive remodels. A lot of people don't want to buy them because there's a big transfer fee. Even if you're an investor, you buy them. $3,500 transfer fee you lose up front. So people are fearful of that upfront money. But at the end of the day, some people come in there and put some lipstick in there. My philosophy is spend money to make money. So I'll come in there, gut these houses. If my grandmother, I wish she was alive, was out there and I wanted to provide a nice housing for her, I want her to live in a really nice place. If these are going to be her last years in her last home, yeah. why not provide something that's beautiful that she can enjoy? It doesn't have to be big. We're not talking 3,000 square feet. We could talk about a 1,200 square foot, two bedroom, one bath, something that's manageable, like you say. And if she can unlock that you're talking about, she, a lot of them are cash buyers. Let them live in a little luxury, enjoy your life for the payment differential of, you know, two or three. $300 more, a lot of them are cash. What's the difference? You yeah, know, and they're not going to, you know, ever go through their money anyway, but Correct. it's just getting them to envision that. And some of them grew up in different eras where they just held on to that money. So right. it's just teaching them and having them, Hey, what makes you happy? Right. Visualize it. What makes you happy? Same right. conversation we have when somebody's getting close to retirement. Yeah. What is you know, financially you're set, but what do you want to do? What's your purpose? Right. And if you don't think about that, I mean, we have it time and time again, where somebody comes back in six months later, is like, I went back to work. Yeah. And it's either because they've lost that purpose or they haven't been that spent that much time with their, their spouse for years. And right. it's like, I gotta, gotta, gotta get out right. or I'm gonna lose the marriage. So right. many different factors there that are involved. So in, in different life transitions, it means something different. So, you know, when if I'm in the real estate industry and I'm, who would contact you? Like, what would be the person you're looking for? You're looking for um, wholesalers, you're looking for, for- Yeah, so for me personally, look, if you're an agent and you have a client that wants an off-market deal, you're tired of competing on the MLS. If you want a really quality turnkey product, again, I'm, I'm of the mindset where we spend money Money to make money. So all my homes are always turnkey. We're doing quartz counters, high-end cabinets, you know, new flooring, plumbing, roofs, the whole thing. So we're providing a turnkey product. Wait, so when you say off market, walk us through what does that mean? Sure. Uh, I'm buying eight to 10 homes a month. So okay. if you're an agent and you're in my, you know, uh, relationship, uh, um, you know, scope. team scope. Yep. Exactly. You say, Zach, what homes do you have upcoming? I will list them. So, so they're off market until they actually go on the market, which is the MLS, the multiple listing service. But if your client has the first opportunity, because we have a relationship, it says, here, I have this home coming up on 88th in Peoria or, you know, 102 in Sun City. And you can bring that to your client prior to the whole masses of the entire, you know, Arizona population to see it. You're providing value to your client based on leveraging our relationship. So that's really nice. So if you want to be in that, you know, uh, team, if you will, reach out to me or let me know what you have, what you're yeah. looking for for your clients I can buy. Um, I'm always looking for wholesalers, guys that are out there have, they don't have the capital, but they have a deal that they can tie up. I'm looking for the agent that has distressed or motivated sellers that they want to make the full commission. I'll pay them the full 6%. You know, they get paid by the seller, but they're going to keep my 3%. I'm licensed, but they can keep um, the full commission. So always looking to get more and more deals, build more and more quality relationships. People that uh, can execute just like us is what I'm looking for. Yeah, know? I mean, if anybody's going to do it right and do good by you, it's you. So, yeah. you know, I, in the show notes below will be, you know, ways they can contact. I know some yeah. of this will be on your social media as well, sure. but you're doing some awesome stuff out there. And, you know, I think you just continue doing what you're doing and leading by example. And that's some of these things, these younger in, you know, brokers and real estate, they can learn from that. So, sure. you know, that's, it's a testament to you. I so I know we, we've gone through, we've gone through a lot. You know, we've, we've talked about our work ethic growing up in the mean streets of Cleveland and Detroit. Yeah. You pulling yourself up off the ground, 2007, eight, when most would have run and you stayed and you said, I'm going to do it. And you figured out there was a niche and there was an opportunity and you made it happen. And now fast forward, you know, eight, nine years from, and you never, I mean, looking back, you probably never thought you'd be where you are today, but it didn't happen overnight, just like training for the Ironman, but uh, you've done it all. And now you're kind of writing that next chapter. So as we, as we, you know, end today, what last bit of advice would you have for the Your Wealth and Beyond Podcast Act? Yeah, I mean, with us. again, uh, it's been fun. It, first of all, it's great to be surround yourself with great people like Andrew. Um, your sphere of influence is always super important. It's always you, it's your team. You know, you always want to again have those people that you want to be in that forest with to help you navigate through. You know, those hardships and the trees and the foliage. Um, 
Execution, again, we spoke about those relationships. Maintain those relationships. You never know when those are going to come in hand again. Um, you know, rekindle old ones that you, you people in that business, you may have done a deal with somebody. Reach out to them. Talk to them. One phone call, it's simple. And then stay abreast of what's, you know, happening in your uh, niche, if it's real estate or finance or marketing, whatever it is, if all of a sudden the new stuff is social media, adopt it. Don't be uh, afraid of it, but embrace it, learn about it, and transition with, um, you know, those movers and shakers. I think that's super important. Um, love and, it. And have fun. It. Have fun. Like, this is a blast. I mean, yeah. you got to have fun. And yeah, and if you don't have that passion, find it, you know, and it's something you, you don't want to look back your last days and be like, I should have done that. Right. Make it happen. You can make it happen. I know life sometimes gets in the way, but like you said, I think you've been having fun yeah. since 02. Some of those years, it wasn't fun, Sure. but you know you were in an industry that you could excel in and that you enjoy and then having the personal relationships and doing the things that make you happy. So And stay the course. I mean, I think that's kind of a, a theme that's popped up a couple of times. Stay the course. I mean, again, like anything else, nothing's easy. The stock doesn't rise every single day. It's easy to be discouraged by, you know, small fluctuations and volatility. But if you if they have the core principles and that core, you know, um, success, stay stay the course. You yeah. know, make it happen. And surround with yourself with a good team. You know, Absolutely. you can't do it alone. Yeah. Family, your contemporaries, and then on the professional side people that are smarter than you. I always look at that. Let's bring in people that are smarter than me. They can help lead. Absolutely. That's key. So I think we should definitely do this again. This has been awesome. I, um, our flight leaves in about 10 minutes or so, Let's so we got to get out of here. But uh, thank you everybody for listening to another episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. Stay tuned later this month. We'll have some great shows lined up. Happy planning, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Investment advice is offered through Baintree Wealth Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Insurance and annuity products are offered separately through Baintree Planning Group, LLC. Baintree is not permitted to offer and no statement made during the show shall constitute legal or tax advice. You should talk to a qualified professional before making any decisions about your personal situation.